Disruptive technologies are constantly emerging and changing markets. To stay successful, companies need to unlock new potential that is currently beyond reach. As a trusted partner in digitalization, Siemens merges the physical and virtual worlds like no other company in the world. We co-create innovative technologies and solutions with our customers and unlock the potential with digitalization. Siemens. Ingenuity for life. Ah, it's working. Good evening, everybody. Welcome at the uh, Siemens Airborne facility. Um, welcome, uh, family. Welcome, team. Uh, we are here at the Siemens Airborne facility today to have the uh, design presentation of the Formula student team. Um, my name is Mieke Hegerus. I'm the head of sales within the Siemens Mobility Division. And uh, I'm very proud sponsor, but also a proud uh, former team member as well. So um, I've been given a couple of minutes uh, to introduce Siemens a little bit to you. And uh, after that, I will hand over to, to Yelmer. Um, let's see if this works because we had some difficulties earlier on. Yeah. Um, but before I do that, um, uh, safety is a very important thing for Siemens. Um, uh, with that in mind, I would like to uh, ask you to pay attention to the, uh, well, the next uh, video for the uh, safety instructions. Welkom in het Airborne Siemens Field Lab Experience Center. Voordat we van start gaan met het programma, graag je aandacht voor de veiligheidsinstructies. Jouw veiligheid gaat voor alles. Vandaag staat er geen testalarm gepland. Gaat er wel een alarm af, dan is er sprake van een calamiteit. Blijf kalm en verlaat het pand rustig via de dichtstbijzijnde nooduitgang. Deze herken je aan de groen-wit verlichte bordjes. Kijk goed waar je loopt. Volg de instructies van Airborne medewerkers met een hesje en ga naar de verzamelplaats die zij aangeven. Is er brand in de ruimte waar je je bevindt? Druk de dichtstbijzijnde handbrandmelder in. Verlaat rustig de ruimte. Blus niet zelf de brand, maar breng jezelf in veiligheid. Blijf bij rookontwikkeling laag bij de grond. Is er een ongeval? Wordt er iemand onwel? Laat het slachtoffer niet alleen. Bel het alarmnummer 070 301 7499. Beschrijf helder en beknopt de situatie en volg de instructies die je telefonisch krijgt. Onze BHV'ers komen zo snel mogelijk naar je toe. Dank voor je aandacht en een veilige en succesvolle bijeenkomst gewenst. So, everybody remember the phone number? There will be a quiz later on. If, if you get it right, you get drinks. Otherwise, <laughs> fortunately not. A um, little bit about Siemens. Uh, what do we do here uh, with Siemens? Um, maybe something about uh, the past of Siemens. Uh, you probably know us from washing machines, uh, dishwashers, uh, mobile cell phones, maybe even. We don't do that anymore. Um, that's ancient history. Uh, we quit that a long time ago. Um, in these, uh, well, these days, uh, we are big in wind power, in healthcare, in power generation, uh, in mobility, uh, electrification of urban areas, and so on. We have approximately 360,000 people working for Siemens worldwide. Uh, we serve more than 140 countries, um, so we have a lot of opportunities for young, talented uh, people. And, um, well, in, in order for us to improve the world, uh, we do need those uh, young, talented and passionate people in our company. So, actually, that's the main reason that we sponsor uh, the Delft team. And uh, that's why I'm here as well, to tell that story. Um, small thing about mobility as well. We've been driving mobility for over a century and a half. So what drives us? It's simple. We're never satisfied because we believe in better. We're forever seeking improvements that will enhance people's lives today and tomorrow. Our greatest asset, intelligence, is required to take our innovations to that next level. And with the future of mobility in mind, we make real what matters. We build intelligent infrastructures that don't just react, but anticipate. 
monitoring systems that reduce train downtime to increase availability. Dynamic control systems that optimize traffic flow and throughput. And electronic information and payment systems that improve passenger experience. These innovations are all made possible by intelligent software made by the people who know the hardware. Us. Thinking mobility further. Yeah, that was a little video about what mobility does within the Siemens division. Uh, as you can see, we do a lot of uh, trains, uh, rolling stock, uh, automation of infrastructure, uh, enhancing infrastructure with uh, software, uh, a lot of payment systems and so on. So there's a big, big challenge in the mobility, uh, the future, uh, and uh, we like to head uh, that challenge head on. We meet to meet the challenge head on. And um, within the mobility division, we have uh, roughly 60,000 people working worldwide. And uh, so we have a lot of opportunities as well there. Um, let's see, next one. Um, but there's a link between Formula Students. Um, I mentioned earlier that I'm a former team member as well. We have a number of people working for us uh, uh, that are also uh, former team members. And um, the link is already goes back really a long time uh, because uh, actually started with the dot one. I'm pretty sure that you saw one of the old cars outside. Um, that was my baby, uh, among others. And um, so you can imagine already how old I am. Sometimes they call me the dinosaur or the fossil of the guy or just the old guy of the team. Um, but I have been involved uh, with the team since 2001. Um, and in the good old days, we didn't build fancy electric vehicles or driverless vehicles. We built heavy, big four-cylinder engine cars and that, that were way too heavy, no wings, no downforce, which was a lot of fun. Um, after that, um, together with a colleague of mine, uh, Steph de Jong, also uh, working for Siemens, uh, we became uh, commentators at the Formula Student Germany competition. And these days also in Austria and Italy. And I'm not sure whether you are familiar with the Muppet Show, the two uh, old guys on the balcony, uh, Waldorf and Stettler. Well, that's pretty much what we do in the competitions, which is also a lot of fun again. Um, so that's a link. Um, my last, last, last slide already. Um, after the presentation, I will invite uh, Yelmer up here. Um, please feel, feel free to come up and have a chat with us, have a drink with us. Uh, we can tell you a lot more about Siemens, about the opportunities, what we do. Uh, so feel free to join us there. And uh, now, without further delay, Yelmer. So, th thank you very much and enjoy the presentation. So thank you, Mickey, for that introduction. And a big thanks to Siemens again for hosting us again this year. Uh, we've been doing it for a couple of years now, and it's always amazing to host our own design presentation here in this building. And to you, ladies and gentlemen, a big welcome to the design presentation of Formula Student Team Delft. My name is Jelmer Blom, and this year I have the privilege to be the team manager of the DOT19. And today I will be your host and host this presentation together with Tim Swank, that's our chief engineer of the DOT19, and Rutger van den Berg. And he's the team manager and the chief engineer of the DOT19 driver list. And as you hopefully know by now, is that as a team we build cars. Here in the lobby, we've seen a few. You've seen the DOT01. Uh, here you see the DOT18, our latest car, and also, for example, the DOT10. And also above our workshop, we've accumulated quite a lot of cars over the years because every year we build a new car. And we're not only doing that just for fun. We also have a, have a purpose, and that purpose is Formula Student Competition. And this competition actually was set up in the 1980s uh, with the goal of giving engineers uh, an extra experience during their student time. Because what the automotive companies in the end, when they hired those students, a lot of the time they had a lot of theoretical background. They have a lot of theoretical knowledge, but they miss some practical experience. They miss the experience of working on a real complex project. And that was the main goal of this competition, to give those students that experience and everything that comes with a complex project already in their student time. And it sort of evolved and evolved, and in the end, we came to this. Formula Student is the biggest design competition for students in the world. And here you see Formula Student Germany, and that's also the biggest competition of all. 
you can see 120 teams here. And those are divided into three categories. You, we have the combustion vehicles, the DOT10 was our last combustion vehicle, uh, the electric vehicles, and the driverless. And I just mentioned it also for the first time, DOT19 driverless. Um, that's something new for us, because this year, the, for the first time in the history of the team, for the first time in the history of former student team Delft, we're going to compete in two different categories. We're going to compete in the electric one, and next to that also uh, in the driverless category. So these competitions, now we have two cars in two different classes. How does this competition actually look? Uh, this competition is built up into two different yeah, events. We have the static events and we have the dynamic events. And as the name already sort of says, the static events are the events where your car doesn't drive, it's just standing still. And the dynamic events are the ones where your car actually drives. Um, it's simple as that. And in total, you can get a thousand points. And in the end, the team with most out of a thousand points wins the competition. Uh, in theory, it's not that hard. And if we look at the division of these events, we first off have static events for the electric team, that's 325 points. And uh, the static events, 325, and the dynamic events are 675. And if we look at the driverless team, for the driverless team, it's a little bit different. There's more emphasis on the static events. And that's almost 50-50. So you have 475 for the static events and 525 for the dynamic events. And if you take a closer look at the static events, what does it actually is? Like we said, like I said before, the main goal is education for this competition. And they wanted to give you the experience of everything that comes with a complex project and not only the engineering. And the first static event is the business plan presentation. Next to uh, building a prototype, because that's basically what we do, uh, you also have to sell it. If you're part of an actual company and not a student team, you in the end have to sell your product. And that's where the business plan presentation comes in. As a team, you have to think about a way to actually make a feasible business plan to sell the, your product, your car, to an actual company. And that's 75 points, and that's the same for the electric and the driverless team. And this is where you can really get creative as a team. This is where you can come up with crazy ideas, think outside the box. And it, doesn't have, it can be futuristic. It doesn't have to be today or tomorrow, but can also be done in five or ten years. And this is also where the creative minds of the teams are, mostly. And the second static event is the custom manufacturing event. And as the name already sort of says, you have to think about the cost of your car and the manufacturing processes. And in the cost report of your team, what you basically do is you write down every cost you have and think about material, think about uh, the rent you have to pay for your building, the electricity you use, the manpower, because as a student team, we have the luxury of 70 to 80 engineers that work an entire year for free. But if you would be in a, at a company, you would have to pay for every hour uh, people spend on the project. And next to that, also manufacturing process. They, a judge could ask you, okay, now you're building one car, but what would be different if you would not build one, but 100 cars? What would be different in your manufacturing process? The cost is maybe different. And all that stuff is combined into, into the cost of manufacturing event. And again, that's the same for the electric and the driverless team. And the last static event is where it differs from each other. And that's the engineering design. An engineering design event is for the electric team is 150 points. And for the driver's team is 300 points. So that's where the, where the difference is. And what an engineering design event basically is, is that you have 10 judges, or around 10 judges, give or take, that stand around your car. And you put another 10 engineers with those judges. And for about an hour, an hour and a half, they're going to talk about the car. And the judges are basically going to ask you questions like, why did you choose this design and not another design? And why did, how did you calculate it? And maybe how did you validate your calculations in the end? And basically, they are going to try to figure out um, how well did you thought about your design? How thorough were you during your design phase? And for a driverless team, it's a little bit different. As an electric team, we have almost 10 years of prior knowledge. We have 10 years of alumni that can tell us, okay, yeah, maybe we tried this and it turned out to be a total failure. Or they can say, yeah, maybe look into this because it has a lot of, a lot of potential. For a driverless team, that's a little bit harder because there's just not a lot of knowledge about the driverless competition because it's yeah, just set up two years ago. And that's where the difference is for the electric and the driverless team. There's just more points to gain in the engineering design for a driverless team. And these were all the static events. And as a racing team, 
the dynamic events where your car starts driving, that is really where everybody gets excited. That's where the heartbeat races, that is where the blood, blood starts flowing. That's the dynamic events. And the first dynamic event we participate in is the acceleration. And what the competition is trying to do is try to test your car on a straight line acceleration. How fast can you get from A to B in a straight line? And this was a dot 18 at former student, at former, uh, student Germany. You have just a starting line. In the, in the distance, you can see two orange cones. That's the finish line. And when they wave the green flag, it's just holding your steer straight, your steering wheel straight, and yeah, full throttle and see how fast you can get to the finish line. And how does that look like in a Formula Student Team Delft car? This was last summer. Yeah, it's pretty amazing if you think of it as almost a football field in three and a half seconds. And now that the competition has tested you on your straight line acceleration, the next thing they do is test how fast can your car actually go through corners. And that's where the skid pad event is for. Skid pad event is basically yeah, how fast can your car go through a corner. So you come in at the bottom, and the first thing you do is you take two laps on the right, then two laps on the left. And what they do is they average, they take the average of your secondary laps on the right and on the left. And again, 75 points in a Formula Student Team Delft car that looks like this. So that's how fast a car can go through a corner. And if we combine these two, we actually get to maybe the idea of how, how you would think racing is. And that's what we call the outer cross. It's basically a lap that's set out on a track and it's a time attack. We have a, a track with cones and it's around a kilometer long. And this is basically, in my opinion, also the most exciting event. This is the event where you can actually see whose car is basically the fastest. Uh, there's, you don't have to think about anything, just get as fast from the start to the finish line. And this was a dot 15 at from a student Austria, that was at the Red Bull Ring, and it looked like this. As you can see, the, the driver is really, really pushing the car. You can hear the tires squeak at, at, at the corners. And what the amazing thing about this is, is that these drivers have never actually driven this track before. The only thing they get is they get a track walk. So basically, the drivers of your team uh, can walk around the track one time. And after that, it's just your team has four runs. Two drivers, so two runs each. And that's all they get to, to set down uh, the best time possible. And also because they can't practice, you get, you get stuff like this. That's where you hit a cone. And it's a big burden on a driver, let's be honest. Um, what you're basically doing is you're driving in, in a car that 80 people spend a year working on. And in the end, it's still racing. In the end, yeah, you also see it in Formula One. Mistakes happen. Uh, in racing, there's still human error involved. There's still luck. And if you hit a cone, that's two seconds on a lap like this. And in two seconds, you're never going to win anymore. And the last event is also where it differs. The outer cross, the acceleration, and the skid pad were all the same for both teams. Uh, but, however, the driver has had more points with the static. So somewhere those points are also taken away in the dynamics. And for the electric team, we have an endurance and efficiency. And what this event basically is, is you have the outer cross track that I just showed you, and they connect the start and the finish line. And that track, yeah, you drive for 22 kilometers. And after, after 11 kilometers, you have a driver change. So they, you get out your first driver, you have three minutes to change into your second driver, and then the second driver also has to drive for 11 kilometers. And if you finish this, you can get um, yeah, a maximum of 325 points if you were fastest. 
And if you finish this, they're going to look at your efficiency. And basically, you can get an additional 100 points if you were the most efficient car that finished in endurance. But if you don't finish endurance, you automatically get zero for efficiency. And this is where it starts to differ from the driverless, because the driverless have a track drive and efficiency. So this is not 325 plus 100, but 200 plus 75. And it has a different name, but it basically is very similar. What it is, is you have a closed loop circuit, just as with an endurance, uh, but you do 10 laps. And the, the, the laps are 200 to 500 meters per lap. So instead of 22 kilometers, like we do with the electric team, you basically only do two to five kilometers. So it's just way shorter in that sense. And this was basically how a competition works for a Formula student team, at least for an electric or a driverless team. But now, uh, how? Nah, since we started with the second team, I got the question a lot, okay, are you basically working on two cars then? Are you in both teams? How do you do that as an association? Well, I'm not in both teams. I'm basically in the electric team. And Rutger is, in that sense, the team manager of the driverless team. But how do we organize that internally? Because it can be quite weird because we do, we've been doing electric for a long, long time now. So how we do it is we, we work with committees. And these committees are basically alumni that, uh, or former core team members that are now back to studying or um, working full time. For example, Mickey is one of those that, are, that is still spending his free time helping us in one of the committees. And the first committee we have as, a, as an association is a technical committee. And the technical committee helps us as a team throughout the year with our design choices. Uh, especially in the beginning of the year, a lot of the times they review our designs. They have weekly meetings with the technical chiefs. Uh, after every design phase, we have a review session where they basically, most of the time, burn down your design. And in the end, it's all for the better of it, because their car, they have an amazing impact on our car. And in the end, their car is way better for it. Uh, the second committee we have is a strategic board. And a strategic board is basically what the technical committee is for the technical people, but then for the management. So all the non-technical people are weekly or once every two weeks in a strategic board meeting. And next to that, the strategic board also yeah, thinks about um, yeah, certain things that exceed the time span of, of a year's team. So if you, for example, has a have a choice to make that influences the two years coming, then you talk with a strategic board and they help you in that decision. And the third committee we have here is the financial committee. And also that name is sort of self-explanatory. Um, they make sure that the current team at the end of the year doesn't owe a lot of money to, I don't know, a company, for example. And that the association as a whole stays healthy. And these three teams, yeah, they guide the dot nineteen team throughout the year. But now we get a second team. We got a, a driverless team, and how does that driverless team fit in this picture? Well, first of all, we got a fourth committee, and the driverless committee. And from the beginning that we said, okay, we're gonna get a driverless team, they've been helping this team set up, and all the challenges they face as a new team, the driverless committee has helped them through it. And next to that, they also do sort of what the TC does for the electric team, they help in the review of their designs. And next to that, next to the driverless committee, the financial committee and the strategic board also helped the dot 19 driverless team. So this is sort of how it organized at the moment. And next to that, we see that in the strategic board, the financial committee meetings, that's also where people from both teams are present. So you keep updated about both teams. Now you know what's going on in the other teams and maybe also where you can help each other. So it is two separate teams, but we do work very, yeah, closely together. And as we, if we dive a little bit deeper into these teams, uh, we have the DOT19 driverless team, and Rutger is going to tell you a little bit more in depth about this team. Because uh, it's not as trivial as you may think. Uh, it's not only people from Delft, it's also people from MIT. So about half of the, yeah, that team is actually not living in this country, but it's living on the other side of the ocean. And that also has some challenges. Uh, but for now, if we look at the DOT19 driverless team, or the DOT19 electric team, this year, the team consists of 73 members. Uh, it is still Delft, so we have 67 men, and unfortunately, only six women. Uh, shout out how they're working in the team, though, because they're really killing it as engineers this year. Um, and it's amazing to see what this group of people can do, because especially if you look at the following fact, that 84% of the entire team yeah, is totally new. 16% only of the team has worked on a Formula student car before. And that, that doesn't even mean that they've worked in Delft on a Formula 2 car, but in general. 
And we are known in Delft, at least, to be an international team. And this year, again, out of the 73, we have 18 nationalities in the team. And they're basically from all over the globe. And if you look at this, we're only about 50% Dutch. So half is Dutch and the other half is from another country. So again, a lot of different backgrounds, a lot of cultural backgrounds, and that's also really fun to work with. And not only the, the different cultural backgrounds, but also the ac academic backgrounds, because we have 17 studies. And these range from bachelors to master students. Uh, we have a lot of aerospace engineers, because I don't know, apparently it's not that fun to design an airplane. Um, and we have a lot of mechanical engineers. And that's also the fun part of it. You can do whatever you like in the team. I did applied physics. Um, now I'm standing here. There's nothing to do with each other. But you can also do something that you think like, okay, yeah, I'm really interested in aerodynamics, so I'm just going to put all my time and effort into that. And that's really fun to see what everybody's doing in the team. And now we've had a team. We have a competition, but we're not going to start out of the blue this year. And we started off this year with a team goal as a team. And this was our team goal this year. We want to win FSG and all co other competitions we attend by building a downforce-focused car and reaching its full design potential with an involved and motivated team that works towards this goal. And if we take a, yeah, a closer look at this team goal, by building a downforce-focused car, what does that mean? Uh, well, our chief engineer, Tim, will tell you a little bit later, a little bit more in depth what this actually means. The second thing you see is reaching its full design potential. It sounds kind of vague. Um, but what that basically boils down to is the fact that we want to finish our car early. Because if you have an amazing design on paper, and it's maybe the best Formula student car ever, but if the competitions come closer and you are not able to finish your car and you're not be able to test it, then in the end, that amazing design is worthless. So what we decided on this year is that we wanted to really finish early this year. And the last thing in the team we see is with an involved and motivated team. And that maybe sounds like something you would say, yeah, every team wants an involved and motivated team. Um, but our philosophy as a team this year is that if people yeah, enjoy spending their time working on the project, then in the end, they're willing to maybe put in an extra hour. They're maybe willing to get up early in the morning and go to the hook before they go to the lectures or just skip an entire exam period because their part isn't finished. And yeah, it happens sometimes. And that's sort of also what we want to achieve. We want to achieve that that feeling of a team that wants to put everything in the, in the car. And all this is not only enough, at least in my opinion. We don't, we have engineers and we have a team goal, but we also need to make sure that they have the tools to actually design uh, and make a great car. And that's where all our partners come in. We have an amazing group of partners. This is only the first one I can show you because not everything fits on one slide. Basically, all our partners, what they do is we need so much to actually design this car. And whatever we need, you name it, they provide it to us. And it could be review, it could be tools, it could be uh, review sessions. It doesn't really matter, and we're not almost not there, and not even. And they help us, and they enable us in that sense to yeah, build an amazing car. Still not finished. And all these partners, one by one, yeah, really help us throughout this entire design process. And please give them a hand for helping us and having faith in us every year again. But one other partner that, that is not on this slide, and that's also friends and family in that sense. Because probably you haven't seen your roommate, your daughter, your son, as much as you have been seeing over the past couple of years. Um, and you've maybe heard some stories about how they're working in a team, but how does it actually look like to be working at Formula Student Team Delft? And therefore, I would like to take you on a little yeah, clip to show you maybe what your yeah, friends or family have been, have been doing so far. Because how does it actually work to be yeah, part of Formula Student Team Delft? As a core team, uh, those are 10 people, we already started before the summer. We already started to yeah, set out some goals. We made the team goal. We thought about yeah, sort of directions we wanted to go to this year and where our focus should be. Because we don't have more people than previous years. So we have to yeah, pick our battles in that sense. We can say, okay, we're going to invest time in this. But then you 
yeah, maybe need to copy a design from a previous year in another way. And only halfway through September, we get the entire team together. And this year, it was at, at Brunel. We had, a, we had our kickoff. And this was also the first time that the entire team was together. You already see the core team. Yeah, they knew each other, so they didn't have to talk. Um, but the rest of the team, it was actually the first time that everybody came together. They have did a, they did an, I don't know, an interview. They maybe read, uh, wrote a motivation letter. And that was basically it. And then when they came together at Brunel, they, for the first time, look at all those innocent faces, by the way, no idea what was going on there. Um, but this is also where Tim, for example, yeah, gave them the first little insight in the car. And they heard in what, which department they were going to work in for the entire year. And we also showed them a little outlook on the rest of the year. What is the year actually going to be looking like? And this is an amazing place and time to actually get the team together for the first time. Because we have 73, yeah, I can almost say random individuals. Now, how do you actually make that a team? Now, we are a racing team, so one of the things we do is we go karting together. And that's also not the only thing we do. Uh, we have also stuff like team weekend. Uh, we have lunch together. We have dinner together. Uh, after every design phase, we have a beer together and look at what we've been doing over the past couple of weeks, what have been going on in other departments. And that really creates, a, at least in my opinion, a team that yeah, also has fun together next to all the hard work. But the carding is one of the things that is not only fun and games. The carding is also to, yeah, in the end, see who's sort of able to drive. Because at a competition, according to the rules, uh, somebody from the team has to be driving. And we need four to six drivers every year. And yeah, if you have a really good car, but in the end, for example, put me in that car, then we're never going to win anyways. So this is the first sort of way to check, is somebody actually capable of driving a car? And we choose around eight, nine, or ten people to actually go into a driver selection. And a driver selection is basically going to our test track in Valkenburg and drive around uh, in all dot cars. And it's also a, a quite an honor to be in driver selection because it's one of the coolest things to do. If you're working on a car for the entire year, then drive them at the competitions. And now that we have the team, we can go to our the Dream Mall. In the background, you can see the Dream Mall. And we start off from, uh, yeah, from scratch every year again. You just have a blank piece of paper and from that, how do we actually start designing? We can just say, okay, let's design a car together. And this is it, Hook. This is our office. This is where all the magic happens. And we start the year off with a yeah, research and analysis phase. That's what we call it. And what that research and analysis phase basically is, is everybody gets assigned a part or an assembly they're going to work on. And the first thing you do is think about the requirements and the wishes and the functions of your part. And in that sense, really familiarize yourself uh, with what your part has to do in the end. And the other thing is learning the rules. Because we got a rule book of 130 pages from a competition uh, with everything that your car needs to adhere to. And those sort of give you the boundaries of the design space you can design in. And in the beginning, it's also a lot of talking. Just, yeah, 84% is new. What the hell is going on in a car like this? Yeah, the only thing sort of you can do is talk about it. And after research and analysis phase, uh, sort, uh, certain departments sort of wander off from the, from the cycle that other departments are in. For example, an electrics has a, uh, a different way of getting to a final design than, for example, a suspension part. And what electrics also does is, here you can see also our electrics hook, they have their own hook. And here you can see our top level electronics. And this is basically all the PCBs in the car. Um, this is not even where they're actually going to be put into a car. This is not where, uh, how big they're going to be. This is just how do all the PCBs work together? How do they talk to each other? And if you have that figured out, you can actually start working on a PCB. And that's also something we do ourselves. And if you know all the inputs and outputs from your top level electronics, you can start with this. And every year again, we design our own PCBs. And it's quite challenging because even if you're an electrical engineer, you probably have never designed an actual PCB. And that is something yeah, quite hard for uh, also for electrical engineering people. And in the end, they also have to put it in Katia. And for a certain reason, electronics people in Katia is not a really good match so far. And next to that, the electronics people or the electrics people also write the software. 
And it is something really hard, so writing software, especially if you have a shortage of yeah, software people. So aerospace people are at our team writing software, for example. And that's sort of for the electrics people. And if we now go to more of the mechanical uh, yeah, parts on the car, the first thing that actually has to be finished is chief, <laughs> is our chassis. And our chassis is the first actual part that needs to be finished. Uh, it's already, the design is finished like at the end of November. And this is something we did new this year. Here you can see a 3D scan of one of our potential drivers. So basically all the potential drivers, it showed yeah, potential during card outings, for example, went into a full body 3D scanner. And that 3D scanner made a 3D scan for all their steering angles. And in that way could figure out how much room do they actually need um, to make uh, a chassis that gives them enough space, but not wasting space because it's too much. And the, the chassis yeah, w was finished around end of November and it's already, in, yeah, already being produced. The first molds have already been made, but this is still at a time where they actually are designing the chassis. And this is also something hard because you have, for example, uh, Katia to understand. You have FEMS to make. Femming is basically making your part and putting all the forces that act on it in a simulation to see if it breaks or not. And that's something that Chelsea, and we, I think we have a really cool Chelsea in the end. That's what they've been doing already so far. Uh, but for the other parts, in the end, we make a concept. After a research and analysis phase, you go into a concept phase. And from your research and analysis phase, you have your boundaries, you have your functions and requirements and your wishes. And then you can start thinking of certain ways to actually make those requirements. And those are different concepts. And at the end of a concept phase, we want to have one concept we're gonna work out. And that's what you're gonna do in pre preliminary design. And then you take that concept you've chosen and you start working it out. And your preliminary design, um, you're actually gonna see that it started to look like a car. Like you can see here, this is actually starting to look like a car at the moment. And like our chief engineer would say, hide your planes, hide your lines, because this doesn't look good. Um, in that way, your car is starting to look like a car. And uh, the goal of the end of the preliminary design is to have a car that's working, not optimized. Um, but if you would, in essence, it would be a working model. So there are no nuts in there, there are no bolts in there, there are the, the brackets are just really simple. Uh, and then you can start shaving off some weight. And that's, for example, what you do in a detailed design phase. That's where you actually get into all the yeah, little things on your car. That's where you can really start looking at the details. And that's the part where it also gets hard because that's the part where you figure out, oh, maybe it doesn't work. Maybe there are a few things that don't match up or don't line up together. But in the end, the detailed design phase has been over. So at the moment, we, as a .19 team, have a finished design. And it's amazing to see that these 73 people so far uh, started off with as a random group of people, a group of people that had their own personal goals, came in with a different motivation. Maybe they want to do something next to their studies, or maybe, I don't know, they wanted to do something for their resume. And everybody had their own reason to join the team. But in the end, over the past couple of months, they sort of came together as a team as well. And all these layers that were put on top of each other actually in the end made the car. And all these different parts fit in the puzzle. And as a team manager, I'm really proud of this team. I've seen this team yeah, start off, do new stuff, like a driver scan, stuff we've never done before in the past 20 years. And in the end came to a, a design that we think, and I'm really proud of, and we think that we can actually win the former student competitions with. And we've been working now for four months and we still have a long way to go. But in the end, I think that this is something as, a, as an association and as a team that we can re be really proud of. And I really want to show you this design. So for now, ladies and gentlemen, the design of Dot 19.
Wow, what an amazing car. This is the DUT90. And before I want to say something about the car, I want to say that I'm unbelievably proud of what our engineers have done in the last four months. We started off in September, as Jelmer told you, and the beginning of November, our Katia workspace looked like this, just two wheels. And just in two short months' time, they created this beautiful machine. And tonight, I want to tell you something a little bit about why it looks the way it does. As Jomer told you, we're going to participate in a racing competition. And just like any racing competition, it's about going from A to B in the fastest time possible. But the part in between A and B is the part that makes the difference in how it looks. If it was a straight line, I think we would design something like this. If it was just two corners, it looks something like this. Maybe it's a dirt track. I think we would design something like this. But no, as you've seen in the video, a Formula student track is tight, narrow, has short straights, and has a lot of corners. So we don't need a high top speed. No, we need a high acceleration. High acceleration forwards to get to the next corner as quickly as possible. High acceleration backwards to break as late as possible into each corner. And high acceleration to the right and to the left to carry as much speed through the corners as possible. Knowing this track and knowing this, we can analyze the track and analyze our vehicle and look at what parameters our vehicle really makes a difference in achieving these high accelerations. First up is the grip of the tires. The grippier the tires are the faster our car. Next up is the mass of the vehicle, the total weight, how heavy it is. Third is the aerodynamic downforce it has. And fourth is the power the car has. And in the beginning of August, we came together <clears throat> where we set out goals. We looked at which of these things can we improve the most on? And can we outperform our competitors? So we will continue our uh, cooperation with Fredestein Apollo tires with our self-developed tires that are already very good. The cars that have been produced over the last couple of years were already super light, about 160, 170 kilos. The downforce is something quite new to us, only a couple of years in. And the power is actually restricted by the rules, so we cannot beat our competitors in that. So from this, we said, okay, our design focus will be a downforce-focused car. And this has been in mind with quite a few decisions we made throughout the year. So let's look at how our design contributes to these high accelerations in all directions. And we're going to look at a little bit of physics, but I think you will understand. We look at the second law of Newton. And it says that the acceleration of an object is dependent on the force you apply to the object. So the harder you push, the faster it goes forward. And the mass of the vehicle, the lighter the, ve lighter the object, the easier it goes forward. Right? So let's look at a forward force. This is part of our powertrain and drivetrain department. In the middle, you can see the accumulator, the battery of the car. This is all where all our energy is stored. And it's the same amount of energy of more than a thousand AA batteries, and you can charge your phone over 500 times with it. From that, electrical current flows through the mode controllers to the motors. We don't have one motor like your car at home. No, we have four motors, one in each wheel. And therefore, we can use the, the grip of all four tires at the same time to push us forward. And next to that, we can make sure that we can send independently power, uh, different power to each wheel. And therefore, our tires don't slip up and we can actually rotate or stable the car. But these motors aren't connected to the wheels directly. No, there's a drivetrain in between, a sort of gearbox. It drives a single-stage planetary gear system, which is integrated into the upright of the system uh, of the car. And this is really a, a, a beautiful piece of engineering, which has to be machined with super high precision. We have great partners for this. Controlling all these complex systems is the job of the electrics department. With over dozens of uh, with dozens of sensors around the car and over ten self-developed PCBs, they imp they process the input of the driver, they monitor the state of the car and the battery, and they give us information about the performance of the car. And they do this all with their self-developed software. And we do this all ourselves, so we make sure that the system does exactly like we tell it to. Nothing more, nothing less, keeping it simple and reliable. So now we have a forward force when the driver presses its accelerator pedal. Let's look at the mass. Mass, a light mass, uh, a low mass, is one of the focuses of our chassis department. And they do that by using a very special material, 
our carbon fiber reinforced polymer. And it means that we use two materials, which on its own aren't very usable, aren't very good, but together make a super strong and stiff, but most of all lightweight material. And as our approach this year um, is really focused on downforce, we approach the design of the chassis a little bit different. Instead of starting with a simple shape, like a bathtub, and then shaping it into a very nice race car, we did it exactly the other way around. We started off with a jet fighter and then trimmed back the extreme shapes to have a chassis that we can actually produce and really use. And this gave us a huge step in aerodynamic performance. And the chassis really is the backbone of the car. It houses the powertrain, the electronics, but most of all, the driver. It keeps him safe. And as the chassis has become smaller, because to give room to all our aerodynamics, we have to make sure that the driver can still perform. And this is the task of our ergonomics department. They have, even though the chassis is smaller, greatly improved the position of the driver to be able to perform. Next up is the sideways grip. If we go through a corner, two things are important here. How hard the tire is pushed on the ground and how sticky the tire is. So let's first look at how grippy, how sticky our tire is. And these tires are self-developed by the vehicle dynamics department. And this is the only real part they design, but they do this really well. They calculate, simulate, and test how we can use these tires the best, and we have grip in all situations. And use all kinds of very complicated models and graphs for this. And combining those gives us, in theoretical, the best performing car ever. But we don't live in a theoretical world, we live in a practical world. So what do we do with this information? A lot of this information goes to our suspension department. The suspension department actually attaches the wheel to the rest of the car and therefore make sure that the wheel moves exactly the way it should. If you drive over a bump, the tire loses contact with the ground and therefore we lose all grip with the ground. So the suspension department makes sure that the tire is pushed on the ground at all times and it actually gives us feedback, gives feedback to the driver through our own design steering system. Next up, and last but not least, is the normal force, the tire being pushed on the ground. And this is the sole purpose of our aerodynamics department. How do they do this? By using wings. Where an airplane uses wings to lift it off the ground, we rotate it around and push the car onto the ground. But how do we determine how these wings look like and where we place them? Well, we can simulate this in computer. And we can predict where the air is going to go, what the speed of the air is, and therefore predict where we want to place wings and how they look like. And this um, can be validated later when we build the car in a wind tunnel and to see if it actually does what we predicted it, wants it, it to do and make some changes if we really want it to. And this is what they come up with, a really cool aero package. And our engineers have done this so well that, in theory, this car will be able to drive upside down through a tunnel at 100 kilometers an hour. Who wouldn't like to see that? So combining all these factors gives us a great performance. In forward acceleration, our car will be able to be accelerated from 0 to 100 kilometers an hour in less than 2.2 seconds. That is faster than most supercars. And I can tell from experience that is an amazing feeling. Through corners, we can reach up to 3.5 Gs. And that is similar to a modern-day Formula 2 car. So it's a remarkable piece of engineering. Last but not least, I want to give a shout-out to our operations department, who did not design anything on the car, but designed this whole event, and do everything around designing a car. Social media, PR, contacts with sponsors. And they designed this very cool livery. Don't you think it looks amazing? So, I'm confident with, with this design, we can compete at this summer's former student competition for the overall victory. But before that, we have to do something that never of us have done before. We have to build a car. And this is what differentiates this project from actual university projects. We have to actually build it. And I hope that the next time I stand in front of you in June, somewhere on the market square, the DUT 19 will be alive and driving. Thank you. All right. Well, my name is Rutger van den Berg, and uh, as Jammer mentioned earlier, I'm uh, the team manager and chief engineer of the driverless team this year. Um, oh, let me grab this. So, 
This is the Dut 18. This is a fantastic card that was built last year by the team and unfortunately had a bit of bad luck last summer. But with Drive Flutes, it's going to get a second chance. Um, so earlier this year, somewhere around February, uh, we were thinking about, okay, we want to build a new team. We want to participate in this new driverless class, uh, which follow the trends of the industry at this time. Uh, and of course, uh, generate a new challenge for us. So, so we had some idea of what an autonomous car should look like, what it should have. It should probably have some nice sensors. It has some computing power and a lot of software. But that's all very generic. So first we need to really figure out exactly what do we actually need. And we, we drew some crazy diagrams like this that don't really look like a dot car, uh, but gives you some idea of what we need. And then when we have an idea of what we need to build, we can figure out what kind of team we need. So uh, what kind of people do we need to design specific parts? And do we need people who can manage these people? Who, do we need people who can get the resources we need? Um, so the team we needed um, is actually very interesting. So around the same time, we got into contact with some students from MIT in America. Um, and they were also very interested in uh, competing in the driverless competition, but they didn't actually have a car to build uh, to convert, and they don't actually have driverless competitions in America. Um, so we, we saw an opportunity for collaboration here. So what we chose to do is to actually work on this project together. So we've got about 25 students in Delft and about 25 uh, at MIT in America working on the same project. This is a very challenging uh, management uh, from a management perspective because half of my team I've never met. Um, if I want to talk to them, I can't just walk up to their office and, and talk to them over what, what's actually going on. I have to schedule a call. Uh, this, this is very challenging uh, and also, in my opinion, very interesting um, because you're, you're working with people all over the world and they don't think the way, they don't necessarily think the same way you do. So that's a very interesting challenge. All right, so we have some idea of what we need to do. Uh, we have a team to do it. But next up, we're not quite there yet because, of course, we're a new team. So we don't actually have anything. So one of the first things we need to do is actually get the resources we need to, uh, to complete the project. First of which, well, as some of you from, uh, from Delft might recognize, this is a room in the library. So for the first, first month and a half of uh, the driverless project, we were stuck in these rooms, uh, usually a different room every day, uh, trying to, to make ends meet. And this is Cyril and I practicing for our first pitch, which was actually for the university so that they would allow us our own office. Luckily, they uh, chose to accept us and uh, embrace us into the dream hall and gave us our own office there. And of course, this was... Uh, put to good use in uh, trying to get obtain more resources elsewhere. All right, so a bit more details about the team. Um, as Yelmer mentioned earlier, uh, the formal student team Delft has always been a very international team. Um, well, as, as you can see right here, uh, I think that Driverless took that to the next step where we've only got about 25% of our team is actually Dutch. Um, half of them is in another continent. And of course, We've also got a very great number of different studies. Um, we've also got a bit more uh, of the master students here than, we, than we've got on the electric team, uh, which also uh, brings some interesting new uh, dynamics uh, to the team. All right, let me just go into the technical details because that's a really interesting part. So if you want to build an autonomous car, um, the first thing you're going to need is to be able to see the world around you. The car needs to be able to detect objects in, in the environment so that it can make sure to not hit them. So we've got two ways to do that. First up, computer vision. Effectively, we use a camera and we use the images we get from this camera to recognize what's actually going on in the environment. So what you can see here is that green boxes are drawn around the cones, which actually demarcate the track. This is uh, very challenging, and uh, especially since we have to recognize them at uh, great distances. Because if you, if you look at the cone two meters away, that's actually not that hard, but if, it, if it's going at 80 kilometers per hour and it's 20 meters away, that's a whole different story. Second method is a LiDAR. This is effectively a, a laser that spins in circles really fast, and whatever it hits and returns, uh, you know the distance at which an object is and the, the direction. So uh, as you can see right here, you can use that to see the environment and also detect those same cones. 
So we have two different ways of detecting the same uh, objects. So now we know where, relative to the car, some objects are. But if, you, if this is all the information you've got, then all you can do is really drive as fast as you can see. If you can detect objects at 20 meters away, then you, also, you can only drive so fast that you can also stop within those 20 meters just in case there's, a, there's an object there blocking your way. So this is what SLAM is for. This is simultaneous localization and mapping. And the responsibility here is to take all the objects we've detected and try to turn that into a map of the environment. Right. So what you can see here uh, is the red arrow, which, uh, indi which uh, indicates the car um, in its position and orientation. And the green dots represent the cones that have been detected. And uh, it tries to create a map of the environment. As you might notice, some of the green cones actually move around a bit as the car gets a better idea of where they actually are uh, after seeing them more than once. Right. So now we know what the track looks like. We know where we are on the track and we know where we want to go. So next up is motion planning. The idea here is to um, use this information to plan the best, the fastest route from A to B. And now you might think, okay, just take the shortest path. That's not that hard. But we're working with a car that really can't instantaneously accelerate in any direction, as Tim explained earlier. You're actually limited by what your car can do. Um, so this is not as easy as it might look. And it looks a little bit like this. So what you can see here on the right is uh, the car um, with uh, the green lines indicate where it thinks the edge of the track is, because not every cone you see is necessarily a part of the track that you right in front of you. Um, the blue, uh, yeah, stripe thingy actually indicates where uh, the motion planner wants the car to go. And as you can see, it's uh, planning a few seconds ahead because it doesn't actually have all the information on the track yet. So as soon as it's finished a complete lap, then it knows the entire track and it can plan a nice route for the entire track and therefore move faster. Right. Next up. So we know what we want the car to do. We want it to move left to make the corner. But we, and we've, to do that, we've got various actuators on the car. But in order to properly make use of them, we need to really accurately know what the car is going to do when we send it a command. That's what vehicle controls is for. They take the commands uh, given to the car and try to implement those using uh, the actuators the car actually has. Ah, and this is the sort of diagrams that are relevant for them. <laughs> Um, so, next up, um, as explained earlier, these electric cars contain a lot of electronics. They keep us safe, they make sure that uh, all the com components communicate together. And luckily, we've got a whole bunch of electronics in there already. It's a very nice car, it already works. But for driverless, we need to implement some extra systems. So, we also have our very own electronics department, ensuring that we have all the uh, hardware we need. Next up, we have embedded software. So we've got a whole bunch of autonomous software that I've uh, explained earlier. We've got some electronics, we've got some actuators, and we've, if we can actually communicate with the, with the people outside the car as well. And all this needs to communicate together, needs to be integrated, needs to make sure that everything is safe. And if something goes wrong, the car comes to a safe stop. This is the responsibility of the embedded software. Um, last, but certainly not least, um, we have a lot of software, we have electronics, we kind of want to know what the car should do. But we don't actually have any way to do that yet. This is where Mechatronics comes in. So they are implementing systems on the car to make sure that it can automatically turn the steering wheel, it can automatically brake, uh, and basically make sure that the mechanical changes to the car are done as required. Now, of course, we are a student team, we have limited resources, so we would be nowhere without our extremely awesome partners uh, who help us out in making sure that this project is a success. And I thank you all for listening. All right. Um, I would like to invite the driverless team up on stage so we can take some nice team pictures and parents can also take their nice pictures.